Welcome everyone to the Transformation Summit. Together we are wise women rising for embodied change. And I'm Alison Palmer, I'm your host. And today I'm really excited because I am speaking with Kerry Hummingbird. Now you can read her full bio underneath, okay? It's right here. So it's full of all the juicy things that she's been up to and that she shares with the world. But I do want to let you know that she is, she's written some amazing books, her international bestsellers, award-winning books. And um, she is passionate about helping people really come through to transform their lives and, and transform the challenges that they experience in their lives into gifts of wisdom. There's much more, so please have a look, but welcome, Kerry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited as well because um, we were just having a little chat about our families and our sons, and what we're talking about today is the mother wound and healing from the mother wound, awakening through that healing. Um, and so this is so, you know, it's going to touch so many people. And uh, let's dive in. And <laughs> let me ask you, what is the mother wound? Why is it important? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think when we hear the mother wound, we we empirically know there's something there that's profound and we feel it deep inside of ourselves. It feels like it's beckoning us. And um, ultimately it's the separation that happens when we're birthed into being and we leave our mother's bodies and we come into our separate human bodies that causes this um, realization of a separation from our creator, from our source. And that's, at all levels, right? So it's our from our physical, biological mother in this incarnation, as well as this separateness from our um, creator at a spiritual level, at a soul level. It's this feeling of, um, you know, being disconnected from all that is, which is a fallacy, actually. You know, because we are, we can never be disconnected from all that is, but we have this illusion of it, and. Every person has a, their own flavor of what that wound feels like, what it's comprised of. And one of the tools that I use to get at that, those what those shadows are, the shadow of the core wound, is the gene keys. Um, gene keys, if people haven't heard of them, I just love the beautiful transmission from Richard Rudd, and it's something I use with my clients. Um, and the gene keys are based on your birth chart and all of that. Um, time and date of location of birth and and what it gives you is a map of your soul's curriculum and one of the the things is the core wound and that is that place of separation we're in the womb and then we're out of the womb and so what's the core wound that we're dealing with in this lifetime and I know mine starts with impatience so you know I'm very impatient about things we see a lot of people in the world today very impatient and what is impatience is it's, it's a lack of trust you know it's like impatience feels like you've got to do it all yourself and you've, you've got to make it happen and no one else is going to do it for you. And, you know, and you can't rely on anybody because, because they've got their own concerns and, you know, and so you've got to force it to happen. And all of this is a really big wound in our society. And there's, you know, there's uh, 64 shadows. So you can just imagine just the way that this wound um, expresses itself in each one of our existences. So we, we start with that wound that we inherit from our time and date of birth and our mothers. And we, um, excuse me, just a minute. Getting over COVID here. Um, and we we start there and then that, that ripples out. And usually there's some, you know, there's some events or something that happened in our early life where that wound gets touched or provoked and we start to create this story that, you know, we can't trust our biological mother, and which, you know, is a representation of the divine mother, the, the consciousness that birth that's into being, right? So we have this story that we can't trust, that we're not going to get our needs met because what? Because one time she didn't look our way or she didn't make the right move when we needed this, when we needed her to move left, she moved right, you know? These are, where it's like out of our control. We can't control this other being and there's this sense of fear. It gets planted there. And then that story just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until it just becomes this entire persona 
of mother, you know, which we think is our actual mother. We think that this persona in our brains that we've constructed, our brains have made is actually our mother. And so this, this persona stands in our perceptual way between us and our mothers. And we're trying to see our mothers, but we can't see the actual woman. We can only see this story that's been created in our brains about her. So at some point, we have to claim responsibility for that whole thing that we created in our brains, not in a punishment or blame kind of way, but in a like, hey, I've got to, if I really want to know who my mother actually is, I've got to clear this story that I created in my brain all these decades. I've got to clear that out of the way so that I can actually see who she really is. And in so doing, you know, we, we become our own mother. We become, we become the mother that we always wanted because that's really the truth. I mean, nobody else can be your, your best mother because it's you. I mean, we're matched up with somebody who's, who's got a set of parameters that's never going to fully meet our needs so that we'll cultivate that within ourselves. So there's like this amazing design of <laughs> souls and souls curriculums so that each of us gets this opportunity to really step in as our own caregiver in our lifetime. So at that journey, you know, from blaming our parents for everything wrong in our lives to really being grateful for this soul that stepped in to um, be our parent in this lifetime so we could learn this soul's curriculum, that's a big journey, but it's a worthwhile one. Mm. Wow. As it sounds really complicated and what was coming through to me was um well many things but one of the things was um um well i said well, many many things actually like what happens if we if we never come to this realization of a mother wound does everybody i'm, I'm guessing that everybody has a mother wound whether we are conscious of it or not but maybe that's an assumption that I'm making. And the other thing is, um, you know, I, I really appreciated what you said about um, the possibility there of having a different relationship with our real physical mother, you know, rather than that one we've made up in our head. And is it possible to get to know that, that mother, um, even if she's passed? Because a lot of people here, you know, my mum is nearly 95, and a lot of people's mothers won't be with us any longer. Um, what happens then? Is it is it important to actually heal that relationship as well? So many yeah. questions. I'm sorry. So many questions. Yeah. No, I'll go back to the other one, and then we'll we'll move forward. Yes, everyone's experiencing the mother wound because if you look at it culturally, um, humanity has um, punished women very repeatedly for the past thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is generation on generation on generation on generation of abuse towards women. And we're all born inside a woman's body. So that means that as we're gestating as babies inside, the, inside of our mothers, we're um, absorbing her consciousness. And if her consciousness is, um, has been abused or her ancestors, which are part of her body or ancestral DNA, and as your body forms, you inherit this ancestral DNA, then you're also inheriting this sort of abuse towards women, towards the feminine. And, you know, there's two basic energies, the masculine and the feminine, and we all have both energies. And so this is why it could affect um, men and women. And so for sons, for example, let's say their mothers have been abused, then sons have this essential quandary within them of like, well, I don't like my masculine parts because I don't want to abuse my mother because I love my mother. And so how do I embrace my masculinity when I see masculinity as abusing femininity? How do I, how do I embrace my masculinity? You know, and we all have different questions within this. So it's, you know, it's not a straightforward answer, but it is to say that we all get to explore within ourselves, how does the mother wound affect me personally and my lineage, my ancestry? Where do I see this? Um, do I see strong, empowered women living their lives um, right next to the men? Or do I see women that are disempowered somehow? Maybe they feel like they can't earn their own living or they can't follow their own hearts or they have to um, be in servitude or they actually are physically or emotionally or mentally abused. You know, so how, do, how does that live within your family system? So that's for every person to explore. 
And why do we want to do that? Because we're at the turn of the ages. So we're, you know, we're moving into the great awakening and we're, we're in this opportunity right now and for the next several generations where um, we can clear the past history. We can clear the, you know, sort of the heavier, denser aspects of human experience over the last thousands of years. And we can bring ourselves into um, a state of being, which is a whole new human. You know, so you could think of this time as dramatic as the time on the planet when the Cro-Magnon man appeared to replace the Neanderthal. You know, there were Cro-Magnon men and Neanderthal on the planet all at the same time for a while, right? And so we're in that transition right now. So what's the transition is from Homo sapien to Homo luminous. So, it, you know, Homo luminous embodied divinity is the transition right now. And so anybody that's listening to these broadcasts and inter in, interested in the word transformation is on the path to becoming Homo luminous, even if that you didn't realize that that's what you were doing. If I say it to you now, you're like, oh yeah, I kind of know this, this seems <laughs> correct. So, you know, that's really the, the call is to do that work right now. And all of us are being invited in to take this journey. And so why do we do the work? Because we want our ancestral line to survive this transition into Homo Luminous. We want to be Homo Luminous going forward for our descendants. And if we don't make the transition, well, we'll stay Homo Sapien and we'll kind of like peter out, you know, because that the new thing coming in, the new upgrade is Homo Luminous. So anybody who um, wants their ancestry to survive is going to be involved in transformation work. Ooh, that's so exciting. <laughs> it is. We talk about the uh, Neanderthal and then the next one, um, because, because it's easy for us to assume, even when we, are, we consider ourselves quite aware people, it's easy to assume that, you know, we'll, we're yes of course we're going to evolve or we're going to develop as a human species but we think it will be like we'll become I don't know super astronauts or something like that without really taking on board that it could be a massive leap just as it has been before um a real you know quantitative leap is that right or qualitative leap both qualitative leap that's the one um and, and so I think that that was a really useful um, example to, to bring here to really drive that point home. And also so exciting, this opportunity for our children. Um, because actually when you were talking about if somebody, a, a woman in your past, in your heritage, in your ancestry has been abused, it brought back to mind, I went to, um, an event in the UK a few years ago and a woman had just written a book about abuse of women and she said she said I literally do not know one woman who hasn't been abused and I sat there thinking oh, that's rubbish it's just rubbish and then I realized that of course it's not just you know sexual abuse or or physical abuse there's so many different ways that women are abused, experience abuse. And it doesn't even have to be within your family, for example. It can be, or anybody who you, you know, tangibly know, it can be the abuse that you're absorbing um, from society about women and, and how, you know, all of that, that we all are very familiar with. So it strikes me, and maybe you'll have something to say about this, that, that everybody has, you know, every, every woman has experienced some abuse, so it's going to be there and an opportunity for us to actually work through this in different ways uh, in, this, in this particular way. Working out the masculine and the feminine, what does that mean? What does it mean for, for, for young men now? What does it mean for older men who are doing this work? What does it mean for for us women, for our daughters who are grappling with this um, realization and what does it mean for, the, for, for us grappling with the masculine energy as well? Very complex stuff. So is, it, is the process very complex or can it be, can it be quite simple to, to go through? To yeah, so 
X, that's a great question. Um, it is important for us, especially as mothers, to um, to heal the mother wounds and to come inside of ourselves in our own inner power. And when I say inner power, many people might think like warrior, like a masculine warrior, and that's not what it is at all. It's it's a it's an inner strength and it's a groundedness, like a like a an ancient tree, you know, has deep deep roots and we often think of trees as wisdom keepers in earth spirituality. And so it's being that ancient tree, that that place that people go to sit against and ponder things and reflect and and feel safe and secure in that space. And, you know, that's a space that women and mothers can occupy when we're in our power. And when we're not in our power, what happens is that we're if we're insecure, then we call to ourselves um, a lot of manipulative behavior in order to get our needs met, right? And that's basically, so a lot of masculine will say, well, women are, aren't trustworthy, you know, because there's plenty of men that have had experiences of women that are manipulative and use them and all this, all this kind of stuff, right? And we, ha we can't deny that as women. We see that tendency in ourselves too, like to manipulate circumstances. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really mindful of ourselves and heal this mother wound so that we're coming from a place of power, especially as um, women. Um, coming from a place of grounded, centered power is going to change all the dynamics in the family system. Um, because you're no longer operating from manipulation or martyrdom or any of those other dragons that we can be facing in our lives. So it's extremely important for daughters or for sons, for the mom to be very centered, grounded in herself and powerful and knowing her power and um, wielding it with love, you know, so wielding it on the behalf for the, for the highest good of everyone in the family, not just of self, but of everyone in the family. And that includes self. So like self-care is very important, for example, um, for um, people in a woman's body, um, my experience of being in a woman's body, and you can check yourself if you resonate with this, is that we need a lot of self-care. We need a lot of rest. We need a lot of um, slowing down. We need a lot of gentleness um, in order to, to be at our best, in order to come to from our highest good. We need to be cared for. And so a lot of women deny themselves that kind of care because, oh, well, I have to go here and take care of this person. I have to take care of this person. I have to take care of this person. And that leads to martyrdom. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of thing where um, you're so centered in your trust and your faith and your knowing that you know you can take care of yourself and that everything is going to work out just fine for everybody you love. And that, in fact, sometimes... Um, fixing it is the wrong solution, you know, sometimes allowing things to have their natural course of, um, of uh, consequence or, or natural life happening as a result of choices is the best teaching that your, ch your child can have. Mm -hmm. And if you get in the way of that, you're sort of interrupting your child's natural connection with life, you know, and life as a teacher. So, you know, this is what I'm talking about. It takes a lot of strength and courage to become the kind of mother that does that these days, especially with so many eyes watching you from all directions on social media and just like looking for any evidence that you're a bad mother. Like, I mean, it just seems like, you know, everyone's just judging each other all over the place. And what we really need to do is come back in and, and really just like come back into the heart, come back into trust and connection ourselves, heal that mother wound and be a stand for each soul having their own life's journey, their own curriculum directly with the one that created them, you know? So, I mean, I don't think I'm going to be, be able to interfere with my son's um, curriculum when he's interacting directly with life, you know? He's, he's having a conversation with life and life's leading him to, con to consequences. And um, yeah, sure, I could res rescue him or try to rescue him from some of those, but then it never gets learned that those lessons never actually sink in between him and life. And I can't be there every single moment of his life to prevent life from happening to him. So I actually have to just let life be, right? And so I feel like um, women and mothers have gotten these really mixed messages about their power and their not power. It's like we're responsible for everything that happens, but we have absolutely no power or authority to say anything about it. It's, it's all convoluted. So the whole thing needs to come, you know, just raised from the bottom and just shoo, no, none of that's true to get back to what's true. You know, there's this interesting metaphor um, where they say that if you burn down the forest, 
sometimes the burning down of the forest is the healthiest thing because then new shoots come up underneath the soil and they grow a whole new forest from a place of health. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we need that kind of reset to happen so that we get back to the truth. Mm. Yes. And um, yeah, well, that could be really devastating. Um, and that brings me to a question that was coming when you were talking about that, because, and you, and you did touch upon it, is that we want to, like, for example, we want to change the world. We want to, we want to be involved. We want to contribute to things being different um, somehow. And yet at the same time, we are um, trying to, you know, from what you're saying, you know, uh, we're in this difficult position of wanting to intervene in things and also acknowledging that that, that event might go somewhere, that person might do something and it might not be the outcome that we want. It, it could be a devastating outcome that we witness, for example. Um, so, I, I mean, I would love if you could talk to that a little bit because, and that seems to me a really difficult place for us to sit with. And especially when it becomes, I don't know, just, um, like for example, injustices, you know, and, and we could be saying, well, of course I want to fight against that injustice. Let's think um, like, like child trafficking, sex trafficking, something like that. Of course I, of course I want to fight against that. And yet, um, and yet if when we intervene, so I'd just like to explore this because yeah, yeah. it's not clear. We're, we're, when, if we intervene, we're kind of, Get, could be getting in the way of something that's meant to happen. So how do we, so, so how do we understand this? Yeah, it's really, it's an excellent question. So all the work happens within. So as we be step into becoming luminous humans, also called, the, you know, being a luminous warrior, you know, of your journey, what you realize more and more and more is that the work of um, any any work is actually inner work because as Rumi says, we're, we're not a drop in the ocean, we're the entire ocean in a drop. And so as we experience the world around us, like certainly sexual tra child trafficking, I, I mean, I'm, I'm completely opposed to that, you know, so that's something that I, I would like to stop. So how do you stop behavior like that? Um, you elevate consciousness, you know, because in higher levels of consciousness, that's not even a part of the equation, you know, where, where there would be, there would be no way that would happen in a higher state of consciousness. So the, the, the answer is to elevate consciousness. So, and, you know, the thing to realize, and this is talked about in my book, The Second Wave, um, there's a beautiful physics section for those science nerds um, from my friend Jennifer Huff, and she talks about how, how can we be the change? Well, as we are embodying our own transformation work, we do our own transformation inside, that changes our level of consciousness. And then as we engage with others, um, we are like plants, you know, it's like photosynthesis. We're always trading light, pieces of light with others as we, like even right here, I'm trading my light with everybody here. Um, there's a, it's creating a frequency. We're having conversation and you could probably feel the vibe of this conversation and what's happening here. And it's somehow informing your energy body about my level of consciousness and what I've been able to learn, right? And I'm, I'm being informed by your level of consciousness, Allison, and everybody listening is being informed by both of ours. And it's happening without, without us like specifically speaking to it, although I'm touching on it now just so everyone one becomes aware of it. You can probably even notice you're feeling it in the space. Mm -hmm. So there's a very different quality to our interview than say the next interview. So just something for people to pay attention to. And this is um, what the shamans have always known this. It's not so much about the words that are spoken. It's more about the vibe that's communicated and shared. And that all happens through the exchange of light. Um, as we gather together, that's, it all happens that way. So as we elevate our own consciousness and then we move about in the world, we're sharing that higher consciousness vibe with lots of everybody that we meet. And the longer you hang out with people, the more the, the consciousness lifts. So all of these low vibrational behaviors are a matter of low vibrational consciousness. Those things don't happen at higher vibrational states. So if we want lying to stop, 
lets everybody become clairvoyant because when you're clairvoyant, there's no more need for lying, is there? Like lying is a thing of the past when everybody can read each other's minds. So if we would like all these behaviors to stop, we have to elevate our consciousness. It's the one true path to doing that. So rather than like fighting, you know, low vibrational consciousness from a low vibrational consciousness state, let's elevate consciousness and let's get really curious about people's perspectives because when we have, and this is what I love, um, they call it compassionate communication now, is that we can, um, if we challenge someone on their behavior from judgment, we actually knock them backwards into that behavior. They'll actually defend the behavior from a low vibrational consciousness place because they're defending their life. You know, it's like, it's a, it doesn't make sense if you're, if you're kind of not in that vibrational space where child trafficking is, is acceptable in your brain, you don't really understand. But somebody in that spot is like, it's, they're stuck in this, this little pocket of consciousness where that's totally normal. You know, and so if you challenge it, it's like you're challenging their identity and they're just, they'll, they'll never understand from that place and they'll just like latch onto it and do it more or try to get away with it or whatever, you know, the addiction gets stronger. So in order to uh, move through this kind of thing, we have to become compassionate even towards the things that we think don't deserve any compassion whatsoever, because that's the path of awakening consciousness in others is compassion and love. So, you know, it's just like the disciples with Jesus, you know, we have to love our brother and our sister. We may not understand why they're doing the things that they're doing, but the only way to help them out of those behaviors, which are hurting them as well, they just don't see it. They don't understand that yet, is love, acceptance, embrace, and compassion. It's not punishment. Punishment just, it just, you know, it sort of cements the behavior in. Mm -hmm. So... And I think we've seen that over the last thousands of years, right? I mean, has war ever really solved anything? Yeah. No. <laughs> so right. So right. Yeah. And and so what I'm what I'm struck by is that it's both actually easy and difficult at the same time, because we can, you know, we have when we're in this situation where we are up against somebody spouting you know from a low vibrational conscious state we have the opportunity to just you know we become aware of our choice at that moment and to connect into our own inner loving being for a, a different higher vibrational um place of, of being and come from there or not we can just dive in and you know rah, 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 if we want to but we have that's the the kind of the easier section and the more difficult part of the equation is that it's actually it's actually I think it's going to be or it is quite difficult not to leap in when something is pressing all your buttons and you're feeling this outrage burning over you. And so, you know, that I think that I think it's I, in fact, and even though um just this is just coming to me now, that that sense of burning is almost, we could almost see it like a purging of of you know stuff that we don't need, like a a, a way of being that we don't need that can allow us then to go into the highest state of consciousness. Yes, I love that you caught that. Yes, absolutely. Because um, people play roles in our life. So that's what people do. They play roles. And a lot of the roles um, active on the planet at this time have to do with raising up to the surface um, traumas that we personally experienced in other lifetimes or this lifetime or that our ancestors experienced so that we can purge it, we can heal it, we can reconcile it, we can, because we have more tools now for compassion, love, forgiveness, and things like that. And so we can, we can actually, we have something to do with that now because we've got the tools to process it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these um, shocking things that are happening in the public eye are happening because we need a collective purge on that behavior. Like we need to bring that into a higher state of consciousness. And so like, you know, not to get political, but Donald Trump really pissed off a lot of women um, you know, in the United States <laughs> and, and that the was world. perfect. <laughs> 
because he was doing the pattern that's been done for thousands of years about women, right? This, he's been doing, he did so many patterns of disrespect towards the female that, um, you know, it, it raised all of our wrinkles because we all needed to purge and clear that pattern of, of, um, of suffering in our, from our DNA and from our, our own consciousnesses, right? And so he served as that emissary of clearing like a big stinky pile of patriarchy, you know? <laughs> so, so we can thank him for that. And, you know, as long as we see it in that context, if we're sitting there in the trenches railing against him, you know, we're just continuing the battle of the sexes and then that's homo sapien, that's not homo luminous. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the, the only way to really move through this with grace is by inviting your soul you know, into this conversation because your soul has a long picture, you know, your soul knows that this has been an evolutionary cycle of, of learning on the planet and you've been part of it and, you know, don't get too hooked into the drama of this one particular moment or this one particular lifetime. There's been a spectrum, you know, and so when we come from the timelessness perspective on things, it's a little easier to you know, navigate tricky situations like Donald Trump, you know, because, um, you know, definitely raised some wrinkles. I mean, I got my wrinkles raised because females in my lineage also were disrespected, were treated like Barbies. I was treated like a Barbie. You know, I let myself, I'm a Smith College graduate, like I'm a smart woman. And then I married somebody that kind of, by, by the end of 20 years, I was, um, you know, I, I felt like a Barbie, you know, and I had to leave that situation because <laughs> that's not who I am. So this doesn't match me anymore. I need to leave. Go find another Barbie. I got to go. Um, I, I'm a thought leader. I have to go speak. So, you know, this is um, this is just part of the wounding, you know, the cultural wounding and, and generations of it. You know, that a woman's only value is her body and whether she's got nice tits and ass, you know, I mean, that's just to be crude. I mean, that's, that's been, you know, the, the human story for how long now on the planet with men, with men prevailing. Mm -hmm. And we're here to change that story now. That's not true anymore. And, and it never was. And we're, we are able to speak that now. And we're able to say, listen, I'm a woman. I have, I have intrinsic value that is beyond, you know, my body and certainly includes my body. And, you know, I'm here to reclaim that truth and I'm reclaiming my power and I'm, I'm in many ways more powerful than men. And, and in some ways, men are more powerful than me, you know, but we, co we co-create, we collaborate, we, we're, we're, we work together. So we're working towards this, this actually authentic balance instead of it being, you know, this battle of the sexes. And, you know, and it's funny, it's really interesting to me to notice how many different gender identifications there are now because because humanity itself is like we're tired of the polarity like like it's created its own spectrum you know in the center because like humanity itself is so exhausted with the battle of the sexes you're just tired of it and so we see this rainbow of gender appearing you know in people's identifications because they're just like we're just done with that conversation we're not going to have it anymore so yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's such an amazing topic and i you know i've got so many questions i'd really love to explore with you and just dive in further but um so this is probably the best time for you know for you to give us some information about what people can do if they want to find out more about you know working with you or what you do or anything Oh, I love that. Yeah. So, um, well, if anybody is interested in finding their own power and, you know, being a medicine woman and going to Peru, you know, look up, look at my website. I've got details about our one year program and our um, trip to Peru, Sacred Valley. We're going to be this year. We're working with a 120 year old medicine woman from the Andes Mountains. Really powerful um, to ha work with her wisdom. Um, so that's up there on the website and, uh, my gift, I'm giving a gift, which is the love mastery game, which is, uh, it tells you a little bit about that curriculum that you're here. Like, what are you here to learn? It's an Oracle game in the sense that it tells you, why is this thing happening to me? <laughs> what is the essential lesson I'm learning? Cause I, the circumstances I'm arguing with and I, I want some guidance, right? It kind of like when we have some insight, we can accept it more. So it's about that and also about learning that on earth we've got lots of allies like um, 
the plants are allies, the animals are allies, the rocks, the stones, they all have wisdom for us. And if we only knew where to turn. And so I give you a really short list of some of my favorite allies um, that have powerful medicine for any situation. And you can call on them, like tobacco is one of my favorite allies. I know everyone's given tobacco a bad rap, but tobacco is actually, you know, a beautiful ally for clearing and for sending prayers and, you know, for, for clearing out, you know, limpiando all the hucha, all the heavy stuff. It's an excellent ally. So just things to learn about earth and embrace being here on this planet. Fantastic. And everyone, the links are right here below. So if this is speaking to you, that's where to go. Um, Kerry, this has been just wonderful, just so rich and, you know, just so many different things to explore here. Um, and, and so hopeful. I think that's, a, you know, a beautiful quality that you really, that's really coming through here. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming and talking about this with us. Absolutely. And if anybody feels called to the, the Earth Mama conversation, I know that, um, Allison, you're also really passionate about this conversation of bringing women together and bringing mamas together. And so I just invite everyone to also check out the website for Calling All Earth Mamas. These are events where I'm gathering together with beautiful thought leaders like Allison, and we're coming all together to have these kinds of conversations. You know, how can we make life better on the planet? What's the true use of our gifts for making life better? Mm. yeah fantastic um so everyone thank you for joining us today and as always my request to you is please share with us you know how is this touching you what's gone off for you as we've been talking have you had one of those moments when you thought wow I was meant to hear this today you know all you need to do is just reply to any of the emails from the summit and say it's about Kerry's interview and anything that you pass on to me that you share with me I'll pass to her as well so she Yay. gets that and you know yeah we really really do love to hear from you so if you feel inspired to do that please do um Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And finally, again, massive thank you to you, Kerry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.